I want to speak today a message that is a little bit unusual, but if you've been at Hungry Gen long enough, you know that unusual is our second nature. I want to speak a message today that will be titled Dragon Slayer. The day where Jesus crushed the head of a snake. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4 it says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I have received, that Christ died for our sins. How many of you are glad Christ died for our sins? According to the scriptures. And He was buried and He rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. I want you to notice that Jesus' death, burial and resurrection is what sums up the gospel. Somebody say the gospel. The gospel is not a music genre, a gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ that Jesus died for our sin, He was buried and He rose from the dead. But I want you to notice this about His death, burial and resurrection. It did not happen in a vacuum. It did not happen spontaneously and it was not a surprise. It was according to the scripture, meaning it was part of a divine plot. It was part of a divine plan that was unfolded in the scriptures. I want us to go to the first book. If you have a Bible with you, go to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and we will open to chapter 3 and verse 15. Before I read Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, I want you to keep it open there. I want to share with you a few thoughts of where everything started and how the gospel came to be. Point number one, we did not need the good news because everything God made was good. Remember, God didn't create us with a need for the gospel. Everything He made was so good that in Genesis chapter 1, verse all those verses we see this God makes things and six times he says it was good it was good it was good and then by the time he comes to make humans he said it was very good turn to your, turn to your neighbor say you used to be very good <laughs> I didn't say you are good because some of them I didn't want you to lie to your neighbor because there's some neighbors they're not good yet they're gonna get good today the Bible says God made everything good. One of the biggest problems people have with Christianity, which I think one of the biggest problems we all should have with just life on earth is this. Why is there evil on this earth? If God is good, why did my child die in a car accident? Why did mom, mom died out of cancer? Why did thousands of people die every single year? 10,000 people die out of earthquakes and we have 10 to 14,000 earthquakes. Thousand earthquakes happen every single year. Why is this happening if God is good? But I want to bring to your attention Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, verse 2, 3, 4 and so forth. God says everything was good. God makes humanity. He says everything was very good. And then God ends this whole thing in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 where God says this, God blesses us. So not only we're good, God gives us His blessing and He says, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth, fill the earth and have dominion. God hands the keys of the universe, of the planet earth, not the universe, the planet earth to His image barriers. We are not a clump of cells. We are not just a progression of molecules going from one generation to another. Our ancestor is not a chimpanzee or a monkey. Our ancestor, our creator, we bear the image of an intelligent, self-existent, almighty God. We, we're not gods, but we resemble Him. We can think, we can create, we can make decisions because we're made in the image and likeness of God. Because God made us in His image and likeness, He gave us the keys because God is a ruler. He gave His children, He gave His creation keys to rule not just a neighborhood, a planet. Now what could go wrong? Nothing can go wrong because it's a paradise. Just one tree for us to avoid and everything is smooth and incredible. But the Bible says in chapter 3 of Genesis where the trouble comes. Chaos, suffering and pain did not come into this earth until there arrived the dark one, the dragon, the serpent. Please understand, we couldn't screw things up on our own without somebody coming in 
and deceiving us into disobeying God. Unlike you and I, we had no human fallen nature. Men were innocent. Men had a pure desire to obey God. Men didn't have a reason not to obey God. But there is somebody who had a fight, an anger, an issue with God. And it was God's enemy, the serpent, the dragon. And one of the ways he wanted to take over this earth was to deceive us to give these keys of this earth to him and then he will do the rest of the damage. He couldn't deceive us. He couldn't get the keys until he would lead us into disobedience. And Satan comes to Adam and Eve and the Bible says, he says this, has God said you should not eat of the tree of good and evil? So he puts a question mark where God said very clearly an exclamation mark and then he asked this question. He said, God knows the day you eat of that tree, you will be like him. In other words, if I can put it in a plain man's language is this, devil is saying to Adam, to Eve, he says, God is good, but he can't be trusted. He doesn't have your best interest in mind. He's holding something good from you and this is where the humanity started to entertain the thought that perhaps this mighty God is selfish. He is hiding something good from us. He doesn't have our best interests in mind and let us follow the temptation, the lure of a dragon. I want to tell you something that our God is good. He doesn't have bad. He doesn't plan bad. He doesn't have a multiple personality disorder where one day he's good, the other day he's bad and you just never knew which part of his mood you're going to ever come on. He is always good. He plans always good things. Where did things go wrong? And we have to address this as Christians because God is not at fault for what has happened on this earth. God gave the keys to the earth to humans because he made them in his image and likeness. We were not descendants of monkeys. We are not animals. We are not beasts. We were made as an intelligent, smart, creative human beings. And with that came dominion and responsibility. But we had a dark Lord. We had an enemy who has a fight, who has a beef with God. And looking at us, I think he was jealous because maybe perhaps this is my speculation maybe perhaps him being cast out of heaven God created us to place us instead of him maybe perhaps and not only he created us as angels but he created us giving us a dignity Satan never had giving us honor Satan never had and on our first day of creation God entrusts us with the keys to the planet I mean talk about a slap in the face to a dragon. He's lived longer than we existed and these naked human beings running around have no idea how the creator of the galaxies has chosen them to be at such a high and lofty place. All he has to do is to begin to plant seeds. Your creator, your God is holding something from you. And Eve fell for it through deception. But Adam committed conscious, willful decision to sin. Satan didn't deceive everyone. He deceived one person and Eve introduced it to her husband. And her husband, instead of fighting that, he embraced that. Deception became decision. After that decision, men started to hide from God who created them. We felt shame. A feeling that was foreign to us. We hid from God and we knew this was wrong so we started to cover ourselves and Satan left us in self-destruction. But something happened in that moment. A transaction took place we did not know. It's almost like the devil offered with one hand something that seemed exciting with the left hand. He took our keys to this earth. For, for, forward thousands years later in the garden, excuse me, in the wilderness. Jesus is, Satan is talking to Jesus and he says in Luke chapter 4, he says this, all the kingdoms of this world I will give to you if you bow and worship me. 
and this is what Satan says, for they have been delivered to me. Who gave them to Satan? It wasn't God. Last time I checked, God gave the earth to us. The Bible says, heavens are the Lord's, but the earth He gave to the sons of men. Who gave that to Satan? See, when we took of that fruit, we took of that lie and we believe that God doesn't have good intentions for us. He is not to be trusted. We replaced God. In reality, we became slaves to Satan. We became victims of his deception and we became perpetrators of his evil in humanity. And all he did when we were not watching is snatched our keys. And he became the dark Lord over this planet. And unlike God, who loves humanity, he introduced calamity, blame, hate, murder, destruction. And this evil started to perpetrate our society. Sin became the law of the land. Now we have this law today called gravity. Gravity works for the rich, for the poor. Gravity doesn't discriminate. Gravity also does not care if you are heavy or light. Gravity works for objects and gravity works for humans. I can grow, put this microphone and it will fall. I can put my watch and it will fall. Gravity works for everyone and it automatically by its force pulls things to the ground. When sin entered this world, this is what entered. The new law came into this world called sin. Where everything good started to get pulled to bad. Where everything great started to degrade where plants started to die, where our bodies started to get weak and old, where animals started to fight against each other, where our oceans started to go boisterous, where storms came, where things started to change even in our ecosystem. The whole world started to actually go into a decay. In one setting, we are excelling. Today, our world is better than it's ever been before. Our phones are smarter. We're not so much but our phones are. Our computers are faster. Our world is so much more connected. You can speak to another person in the other part of the world. Yet the evil, decay, death, and suffering, murder, rebellion, hatred, racism, abortion, miscarriage, evil committed by us and evil committed by natural disasters. There's a law of gravity that every single person is born to. It drags you to the bottom. And most of us say, well, God is responsible for it. Not God. We gave the keys to the dark Lord and He is bent on destroying us and destroying, slapping God in the face. See, the worst thing about this sin that started to happen is in chapter 4 of Genesis. Are you with me? Are you guys in the gym with me? In chapter 4 of Genesis, the Bible says that a first family already has children. Cain is one of the children. And Cain is struggling with something in his heart toward his brother called hate. This hate is getting so strong that God is noticing and God comes to Cain and God says this, Cain, he says, sin so it's not just a serpent no more, not just a dragon. Now the sin, I want you to see this. It started as Satan coming in taking the keys. But now the law of the land, the rule of human heart is another entity living there that has a mind of its own. And God says sin is crouching. Another translation says lies at the door and the same word is used for a predator hiding behind in the bush. So this is not just Satan now. This is the nature of human heart is like a predator seeking whom they can devour. And Cain did not have a rifle or semi-weapon. He kills his own brother. And interesting, when God comes, God does not blame the stone Cain used. He blames the Cain who used the stone. For those of you who think that all we need to do is remove guns from people and murder will stop in our shooting will stop in our schools. I want to tell you something. Guns don't kill people just like pencils don't misspell words. Matthew 15, Jesus says that evil comes not from the devil now. 
It doesn't come from God. It comes from the human heart where there is a gravity that pulls every one of us, no matter how rich you are, no matter how many degrees you have attached to your name, you have a gravity lives inside of you and it pulls you to the ground. It pulls you to decay. It pulls you to hate. It pulls you to sin. You may say, I don't believe in God. It, it's the same thing as if you walk around and say, I don't believe in gravity. Gravity, you don't need to believe in gravity for it to work. Sin, you don't have to believe in sin for it to work. By default setting, you and I have a disease inside of us called sin. And this sin is disobedience. We sin in our thoughts, we sin in our attitudes, we sin in our motives, we sin in our words and our works. We sin by what we do, we sin by what we don't do. We are penetrated with this disease. And the interesting part, at the same time, we're smart. We got airplanes, we got we can go to space. Our cars now can drive themselves. Our computers can write books now by themselves. I mean our world is so incredible because we're made in the image of God and that part is never removed. Yet we have a gravity inside that drags us down. And on the top of that because we're advancing externally and regressing internally, deception comes in. I'm fine. All I need is try harder. So what God introduces before He brings a Savior, He introduces this thing called the law. Before God introduces His Savior, He introduces His diagnosis. Why does He bring the law? To prepare us for the cure He's about to give us. You will never receive the cure if you don't know you're sick. Sometimes we live in the world where the devil will lie to us and say that the symptoms you have is not a disease that's just normal but God introduces the law in fact when he introduced the law to his people Israel Israel was already breaking that law on the bottom of the mountain and Moses breaks the law knowing we can't keep it can I submit something to you God didn't give us the law for us to keep he gave us the law for us to break the law of God is like a thermometer you put under your tongue. It's to measure how sick you are. Measure your temperature. How many of you know if you swallow the thermometer it doesn't break the fever? <laughs> so for those of you who think that if I'm gonna try to live harder the law of God, I'm going to break this sin. No, thermometer is not an Advil. Thermometer is sent to measure to you and let you know you are sick. But then God now says, I have a cure. The law of God is like a mirror. It's not a shower. By looking in the mirror, you don't get washed. By looking in the mirror, you get reminded that you don't look good. God introduces the law and the law introduces guilt and that is a purpose for guilt. For those of you who feel guilty, you're like, man, God take away the guilt. Guilt is good because guilt points to a problem. That you have a disease that only God can cure. Now, what our culture has introduced is the culture introduced therapy. Forgive yourself, love yourself, self-gospel, meaning a good news of you don't need God. You just need to you need to practice your breathing you can breathe your your sin out as long as you don't judge yourself but you love yourself you will find peace i get it there's just one problem with that every sin you commit you incur debt with god even if you could forgive yourself of what you did it doesn't change the fact your record is gathering debt Imagine this, you go on the shopping spree. You take six credit cards, max all of them out. You buy a lot of stuff. You come home, you feel guilty. You're like, let me meditate. Let me practice my breathing. Let me tell myself, I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. I love myself. I love myself. I'm good. I'm not a shopaholic. I just like things. <sighs> I feel so much better. How many of you know that doesn't pay off the credit cards? doesn't matter what you tell yourself. It doesn't matter what garbage you fill into your head. It doesn't change the fact. The credit cards will be calling and say you owe us this and that. Please understand, no matter how much perfume you spray on the corpse, the corpse is still dead. 
It doesn't matter how much self-help books we read. It doesn't change the fact our sin offends a holy God and that record and that debt somebody needs to pay. New Age, Hinduism, Buddhism, none of that can pay that. Now we can help you to calm your mind for a little bit but it doesn't change the fact you stand in front of a holy God and you owe a debt you cannot pay. Some of us will say well I'm gonna try good works. It doesn't change that. It's kind of like saying I got all of this stuff that I bought from my shopping spree. I got like 27 shoes and seven suits and I got a lot of you know belts. So if I'm gonna go right now and give it to my neighbors, my debt will be paid. You still owe that debt. My friend, we have an incurred debt with God. Not only sin is a disease, not only sin is a disobedience to God, not only sin separates me from God, but while I am sinning and saying, God, I don't want to do anything with you. I am done with you. You don't put this guilt on me. I just want to live how I want to live. At the same time, you keep slicing the corn and your debt has an interest rate, keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. And one day you're going to have to stand before God and make a payment in full. And my friend, that payment, the wages of sin is death. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God knows this. God sees our problem. We're sinking deeper and deeper. We're deceived. We're disillusioned. We are desensitized. We are dead in our sins. And when that is happening in the garden, are you in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15? You waiting for me there? This is what God promises when all of this is unfolding. I will put enmity between you, he's speaking to the dragon, and the woman. Between your seed, so people who will propagate the serpent's works on this earth, and her seed. Now, you don't have to be a biologist or no human autonomy, to, 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 to no human body, to know one thing. A woman has eggs, a man has a seed, a sperm. And when an egg and a sperm goes together, a little babies are made. A woman does not have a seed. The word here for a seed is sperm. A woman doesn't have that. My question to you now, what is he talking about? A woman will have a seed. Theologians and scholars tell us, Genesis 3 14 is the first gospel preached by God to our parents. God is telling them, you guys screwed up. You made a mess. You are deceived. Disease is spreading in your body. Your world is going down and your world will keep going down because the dark Lord took over. But I'm going to plan an invasion into an enemy's territory. And God is telling the snake right away, there is a rematch coming. There is going to be another human being that will show up. He will be born from a woman, but he will not be born because of a man and a woman. It will be a virgin birth. And God is telling the serpent, you deceived my first man, Adam. But I'm going to send another man named Jesus. You will not trick him or deceive him. Because this man will rematch. This man will pretty much undo what the first man did. He will be born out of a virgin because it will be a seed of a woman. But I want you to notice this, what God promises here. He said, he, Jesus, will bruise your, no, no, no. He speaks, speaks of serpent, I apologize. He will bruise your he will bruise your head. So this speaks of serpent bruising the head of our Savior. And you, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. I never saw Jesus' death on the cross and the suffering he endured as something that Satan had something to do with. I always thought that this was just God creating all of this situation to pay for our sins. But the first prophecy concerning Jesus' death has to do with the dragon inflicting pain on the man, Jesus, who will come on this earth. He will bruise his heel. Satan deceives Judas to betray Jesus. He's involved in bruising the heel of Christ. 
The Bible says in Corinthians that if they would know, the rulers of this age would have known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. So thousands of years pass and an invasion takes place in a very small town. It's like an arms pit of Israel. Nobody knows that town. Nobody cares about that town. It's not big or famous. It's not New York, Los Angeles or Las Vegas. It's Nazareth. Jesus is born there and God makes an invasion. Angels get excited. They intrude into this realm dominated by the dark serpent. Jesus for 30 years almost disappears. You don't see him. 30 years later there's a cousin of Jesus named John who is stirring up messianic hopes because Israel for years had these hopes Messiah is coming and John finally showing up which was prophesied that I will send a messenger before your face and as John comes and he says he's already almost here the kingdom is already here get ready guys get water baptized he baptizes them and then John makes this crazy declaration he said he's not just coming he's already here in fact I already heard about him and God told me who the Messiah is and he points to Jesus and says behold the Lamb of God the hope the Messiah is coming is going through the roof Mind you, for Israel, they're not expecting a savior to crush the dragon. They're expecting David 2.0 to kill Romans. Israel is expecting someone to make Israel great again. Restore their dignity in the nations. Kill them Romans. That's what we need the Messiah for. So Jesus comes and disciples of Jesus are signing up for this campaign. I want to be a part of this Messiah who's going to crush Rome and make Israel the beacon of hope for the world. For three and a half years, Jesus' message doesn't seem to fit that paradigm. He says, I'm the king, I'm preaching the kingdom. Yet he says things like, you got to go low to go up, you got to die to live. A completely opposite, but they think Jesus is going to get on board with the program. One time, Jesus walks on water. They think this is going to be super great. When we need to cross from one place to another, we don't even need boats. Our Messiah walks on water. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. I mean, his portfolio, his resume, perfect. Disciples are signing up. People are signing up. And on the top of that, this Messiah is good. He's not just conquering, squashing stuff. He's actually helping people. Then, right before his crucifixion he rides into Jerusalem and Jerusalem is one of those places it's like New York Washington DC it's like Seattle it's one of those places if you really want to become famous that's where you go so disciples are seeing that a week before this he raised Lazarus Jesus's viral videos going around Jesus's poll numbers are high through the roof this is incredible Messiah right about now Jesus is gonna disclose his secret plan crush Rome they're going into Jerusalem everybody's getting the news He's riding on a donkey. People are shouting Hosanna and Jesus doesn't stop them. This is incredible. Messiah is coming. He's, it's almost here. Disciples are getting ready. We will be famous. They're debating where they will sit in his new kingdom. And Jesus keeps hinting, I will die and rise again. But of course it goes one ear in and the other way out. Why? Because they have a paradigm. Messiah will squash Rome. What they missed is the Messiah will crush the dragon. Rome is not the problem. Rome didn't take over the earth. The dragon did. Rome is just a pet in the dragon's hand. Rome, Greece, evil, murder, all of that. There is somebody pulling the strings and it's a dragon who watches who is the ruler. Jesus is the ruler of this world and Jesus isn't coming to kill the symptoms. He's coming for the head of a dragon. But before he crushes his head, the dragon will bruise his heel. The hell we live in today on this earth where we see evil. God not only feels our pain, but God is not responsible for that. And God invaded our world by becoming a man, growing up and going straight for the head of that dragon. 
and hurting him in such a way where he will never recover and reclaiming us back to God and reclaiming the keys of this earth as a human. Jesus says all the authority has been given to me. Why did he say that? Because he's a fully man who now rules the planet. He's the legal rightful king of this planet. On Thursday night disciples gather and on this Thursday night it's a Passover meal. During this Passover meal they celebrate the exodus from Egypt. And that night, a few days before that, Judas, a few days before that, Judas already made a deal with Pharisees that he will deny Jesus. Judas didn't think it will work because he's seen people, Jesus walk on water. He thinks this is, this is not going to work. I'm just going to get some money. Jesus is going to spank them Pharisees. Romans are going to see the power of God and I'm going to get make some money on the side. He didn't think it will work because Jesus is God, he's Messiah. He will not be tricked except on Thursday night after their meal, the prayers, Jesus surprisingly gets arrested. He chooses to be arrested because when they said, are you the one? He says yes and the soldiers fell back because of the power of God and then when they got back up instead of running for their lives Jesus pretty much put their, his hands up. He willingly went to get arrested. That's not what Messiah should do. Their paradigm is being broken and something begins and this is when the dragon came out and started bruising the heel of Jesus. It started with his friends betraying him. Jesus gets to six trials and six trials find him guilty even though he's innocent. Thursday night he barely sleeps. Most likely that's when he was beaten, scorched, made fun of. Soldiers mocked him. By Friday morning they decided they need to execute Jesus and crucify him. Now please understand crucifixion was the worst form of death anybody could die. It was so terrible that Romans who did it never crucified their own citizens. That's why Paul was beheaded. He was a Roman citizen. He wasn't crucified. It was so hideous. It was a statement by Roman Empire. They would hang those criminals and rebels like a billboard to everybody to say this is what's going to happen to you. And what they decide to do is to crucify Jesus. Not only that, before they crucified him, they scourged him. And while this is scourging has happened, I want you to know this is not just God allowing Jesus to pay for our sin. There is a dragon breathing and seeking to inflict pain on our Savior because he wants to bruise his heel. He's not gonna let the fight go. He's not just gonna accept his defeat without inflicting some pain on our Savior. And at, at, at the time of 9, 9 a.m. on Friday, after losing so much blood that the history says most people who go through that beating they don't survive and they die at the whipping post. There's a famous saying that says that he was scorched 39 times. That's not true. You know why? Because the Jewish law had a rule. You cannot beat somebody more than 39 times. Guess who was scorching Jesus? Romans. They don't have that law. To them, you beat a person until you think you're done. So there was no law. They didn't keep a law in beating a criminal. When they beat him, they beat him so much that the Bible says when they put a cross on him, he couldn't take it anymore. And that's when the dragon was really inflicting and bruising the heel of the seed of the woman. And then at nine o'clock, they hanged him on the cross. They put a nail, most likely not through his palms because if you put a nail through this, it will rip right through. They put it right through his wrists so it could have a support. And they put a nail right through his feet. And from nine o'clock till three o'clock, there was no worship music. There was nobody praying for him but people mocking, people ridiculing. Even the criminal next to him was saying, if you are the Son of God, if you're truly that. Disciples already scattered. They couldn't take this. Their world is broken. The mom of Jesus is standing there. The prophetic word was long time ago, the sword will go into your heart. But she didn't think just a week ago, Hosanna, just a week ago, he was the Messianic King. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. To see my own son being put to shame and embarrassed on the cross and the dragon is bruising the heel of my Savior. The heel of this new human who is fully God and fully human. By the, by the time it hit three o'clock, 
something else was happening behind the scenes the dragon did not know about not only Jesus voluntarily chose to be bruised God put all the weight of the sin he took your debt and he put it on Jesus's account and what the dragon did not see coming he wasn't just wounding my Savior my Savior was being bruised for my transgressions wounded for my iniquities the chastisement for my peace was placed on, on, on him this was a dual bruising that was taking place the serpent bruising and the father putting all of my sin upon Jesus and when it was done my Savior shouted it is finished what that meant the word it is finished in the original language means paid in full not only the heel was bruised but the debt was paid and what the devil didn't see coming is God clearing the record of everybody's sin in one simple death what he did not see coming is these human beings that he captured now can be forgiven and God says payment received by ripping the veil in the temple and says I'm getting out of the temple and I will live in the temples of people's hearts it is finished at the age of 3 p.m. Jesus dies now you must understand the gospel is that he dies for our sins he gets buried and he rises again you have to understand something about Romans is they don't give you a burial if they crucify you you are not allowed to give a crucified offender a proper burial why because they wanted to shame a criminal so bad to make you carry your cross die on your cross and in that culture the way you honor this person's life the last moment of honor you give to the person is how you bury them that's why there was a huge emphasis not burning bodies cremation was not a thing in the Jewish culture it was very important that people are properly honorably buried and Rome has a tradition that if we crucify you you will stay on the cross for weeks and once the birds ate eat your eyes and they poke different parts of your body and your body it begins to rotten then they take the body you're not allowed to bury it you're thrown into a dump outside of Jerusalem called a garbage dump and they set a fire so the disease the disease doesn't get into the city but my Bible says that he will be buried in the tomb of the rich because there was no deceit in his mouth and no transgression in his heart Mary is not at the cross anymore because she can take it most likely the disciples are gone Jesus' father Joseph is dead history says comes a rich man called Joseph of Arimathea he calls Pilate and says Pilate Jesus is not my relative you need to give me that body I know Rome says we got to throw them into a dump but that man needs to be buried at my tomb little did Joseph knew is he's filling a piece in the puzzle where Jesus is dead for our sins bruised by the serpent and Jesus is buried Roman customs are broken and Jesus is honored in a rich man's tomb because he had no sin by six o'clock Jesus is laid in the tomb at six o'clock Sabbath starts because their Saturday didn't start on Saturday morning their Saturday started on Friday night everybody has to go and celebrate Sabbath Pharisees quickly send a message to Pilate and says we remember when he was talking about this thing we heard him say something about dying didn't take it seriously but now that we remember it he also mentioned he will rise again we need to put something to guard his tomb because somebody will take his body how foolish they were disciples didn't even believe Jesus will die not even rise from the dead they put the bodies of soldiers 16 soldiers 
were guarding the tomb. Four soldiers guarding the front and 12 soldiers taking rotation so they can sleep and circle around, look inside and be ready for any assault. The tomb was closed. Jesus was in the tomb that had no air. People who say that Jesus didn't really die, his heart was pierced, blood came out and water, he was already dead and he was placed in the tomb that was airtight, sealed. They put a stone, it's a piece of granite that weighs, Georgia Tech people who studied this, they said it weighs about one to two tons of weight. It's a very heavy piece of granite that they covered his tomb and they put a seal on it and the trained soldiers they will have to be executed if they do not allow, if they allow somebody to get inside of the tomb. This is how serious this was for them. They're guarding the tomb all Saturday. Jewish laws don't apply for them so they're guarding it while Jewish people are celebrating the Sabbath. And the Bible says early Sunday morning, an angel comes from heaven and he makes an arrival that the earth shakes. The seal snaps. And the angel rolls the stone, not to help Jesus get out. He was already gone. But to let everybody else get in and see him you're seeking, him who you're seeking is no longer here. It wasn't just his death that gave us forgiveness. What gave a confirmation that we have been forgiven is that God has raised Jesus from the dead. Death couldn't hold a perfect sinless holy man. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 it says, In as much as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same, that through death he might destroy him. Who him? The dragon who had the power of death. That is the devil. And what God did on that cross is he mortally wounded the biggest enemy we have had. And this wasn't Rome. It wasn't Republicans or Democrats. Our biggest enemy was sin. Our biggest enemy was the dragon. And Jesus deals a blow as a full human and full God. And in this hellish hole we live in today, Jesus starts a campaign of rebellion and a sabotage against a rulership of this kingdom. C.S. Lewis says this in his book, enemy occupied territory. That's what this world is. For those of you who think that just because God created this world, this world is perfect. I just gave you a picture of where things went wrong. What happens today in this world? We live in an enemy occupied territory. Imagine yourself during Hitler's invasion of Europe and you are in France. That's exactly what's happening in the last five, six thousand years. We are part of an evil tyrant running around today and inflicting, injecting venom into people's veins called evil. And we all have been deceived by it, are victims of it and slaves of it. And instead of blaming God, God isn't our enemy, the dragon is. God sent His Son to be born in this enemy occupied territory. He didn't need to do that. He could have washed us clean. And this Son named Jesus lived a perfect life. He let the enemy bruise Him. But He paid the price for our sin. And this Son, Jesus Christ, mortally, fatally wounded the head of the snake. C.S. Lewis says this, enemy occupied territory. That is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king landed. You might just say in disguise and is calling us to take part of the great campaign of sabotage. That's why when I become a Christian, you become a Christian, it's not just about my sins being forgiven. I'm joining the rebellion. That's why I believe in the marriage of one man and one woman. I'm a rebel. That's why I believe that killing babies is murder. I'm part of the sabotage. That's why I believe that raising our children in the ways of God, not into the woke part of our culture, is part of a rebellion. 
my friends there's evil inside of you that only God can remove through the blood of Jesus Christ but when God forgives us he enlists us into his campaign that's why we want to plant churches why because we're pushing back the darkness why because the head of the snake has already been wounded that means that we can reclaim the territory for God we can reclaim our schools for God come on somebody in the gym make some noise we can reclaim our health for God we can reclaim our mind for God we can replay reclaim our finances for God why because we're no longer under the spell of the dragon let me ask you a question will you follow the lamb or will you follow the dragon will you follow the lamb who died for you and who will roar for you like a lion Jesus will come back on this earth you know why this is now his earth that he has a full rightful authority he has the keys I have the authority Christ says he will come and restore full dominion until that day I want to ask you follow the lamb let's push back the darkness if you're part of the devil's scorpions that serpents and dragons spell today come from it repent run from it because that will end up in your full defeat and full separation from God you will have to answer for all of your sins but Jesus is already taking care of that for you he loves you so much the dragon doesn't care about you if I, if you don't believe in that look at the disease and the sickness the dragon is after your destruction he wants to eternally separate you from your creator because he has a beef with God run from him run from his lies and his deception and join Jesus's campaign hey thanks for watching to this sermon if this was a blessing to you would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message what are you taking home with you from this message also if you enjoyed these messages would you help us and hit thumbs up for this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.